What's up, guys? We are back with another episode of the After Hours Podcast. Uh, today, we have a very special guest, uh, Tyler. He is one of the junior moderators in MIC. Uh, Tyler, thank you for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me, Harry and uh, James. Of course, of course. So we always kind of follow like a very similar structure. And like, I guess the first question is, how did you get into trading? And how did you kind of get to where you are now? Yeah. Um, so I'll, I'll bring us back to, I guess, junior year in college. This was the spring of 2016. Um, I was a finance and business analytics major uh, at the University of New Hampshire. I was in a few finance groups. And so I always kind of loved analytics and finance and business, um, what have you. But I think I came across a YouTube ad for another chat room, and that's what sparked my interest. Um, I was in a, an investment group that was just kind of like holding a long-term portfolio, and I was like, there's got to be a different type of investment. Yeah. This. And yeah. uh, the YouTube ad just you know, came at a perfect time for that. Uh, and so I ended up joining that group. I was in that group for, I think, three years. But originally, once I was in that group, I bought a few DVDs. I learned you know, just kind of what day trading was about, which I'm super grateful for. And it was probably within the first two months, I knew that that was something I wanted to do for the rest of my life, despite not even trading, not even making money. I, it just, I, the love and the joy I felt for it was great. So um, that's how I got into it. And then I guess I'll just kind of yeah. carry on. Were you maybe. having any success at that time? Or was it kind of just like losing money or like really just still trying to figure, like even starting yeah. out? Yeah. So, so within those first two months, I wasn't even trading at all. Um, I had an internship over the summer. So going into senior year of college, I took pretty much all the money I made for my internship. And mm -hmm. I opened up a TD Ameritrade account and was just like longing nice. breakouts for like what felt like two yeah. years. Um, so I wasn't making any money. I think I lost like 75% of the money I made on my internship. Yeah. Um, and then yep. towards the end of my senior year in college, though, I knew that I wanted to take trading more seriously because it was tough honestly for me senior year like I wanted to enjoy myself I took school very seriously um I don't think I balanced things as well as you did Harry um and once I <laughs> well I don't know about that <laughs> <laughs> upon graduation I was like all right like if I want to take trading seriously I gotta find a way to to do it more full-time while I still have another job and so I kind of had the idea to move from New Hampshire on the east coast to California on the west coast so I could actually wake up early for the market open before I did my normal job. And right now I'm in I think that's sick. Kind of bank. Yeah, thank you. I think it that's was, sick was... because that's like, that's dedication, man. I mean, with California traders, I have so much respect for because waking up that early is not easy. And especially for trading where it's a job where like, you never know if you're going to get paid, if you're going to lose money. So it's, yeah, it's yeah. tough. So I, I respect the hell out of that. That's cool. Thank you. Yeah, it was, it was crazy because I didn't know anyone out. And I was in San Francisco at the time. Didn't know anyone, wasn't making money trading. And at the time, I was still in the other chat room, so I was waking up 10 minutes before the bell. And obviously, yeah. over time, the process evolved to wake, now wake up at like 3.30 in the morning, yeah. um, which, is, which I absolutely love, surprisingly. Um, yeah. But yeah, I guess that's, cool. that's how I got into it. And then I can touch on more like when I joined them, I see and, and how things started to change if you want. But that's kind of how I got into it. Um, yeah, maybe go in. Yes. So, kind of, so you were a part of that kind of room, whatever it is. I'm sure people listening can decipher like it's one of the main <laughs> one of the main usual um so um you know you kind of break away from that room you get into mic um yeah how did you find out about mic in the first place and then how did you kind of see your trading maybe change a little bit once you joined yeah great question um so i joined mic i think two or three months after it was it was created so i think it was in the i joined probably early winter of 2018 maybe uh, towards the end of the year. Um, and I found out about it just through Twitter. I think that's how yeah. Alex or Bao post about it. And I knew about them on and off for the years prior being in that other chat room. I just yeah. was exposed to other names. So really grateful that I was on Twitter at the time when I saw that. I joined immediately. I was a monthly member for probably a year and a half. And then I, I transitioned to annual. But um, for the first year in MIC, I was still under PDT and I was still just like longing stocks. Um, I think I was trying to break all the bad habits that I, that I was, that I created. Um, and it wasn't till the spring of 2019 when I opened up um, a Venom account to start shorting under PDT still. I think over the last two or three years of longing, I realized that there were so many ways to lose money long that might as well like just kind of flip it and see if I'm comfortable shorting and doing the same thing. Um, and I spent a year under PDT just shorting with Venom. And it was so difficult because you, you don't have the shares available to locate any of the stocks that are typically on the watch list. And 
it, it, it was really difficult. Uh, I was trading probably once or twice a week, like non net setups just to like force myself to short. Um, and it was really difficult and I wasn't consistent whatsoever. Um, and then during that time, I was just saving up a ton of money from my, my full time job. And then in the spring of 2020, so I guess almost a year ago, as of last month, I opened up an account with Cobra uh, to short and it was above PDT. And then it took me probably six months with that account to start to find some consistency. Um, I was probably trading like three or four different setups at a time. Like I had a pretty refined process, but the one big thing that I was doing wrong was just trading so many different setups and not sticking to one. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, your story is cool because I feel like I've, I, I don't know if anyone knows, but Tyler and I met up last spring, actually. It was like right around the time you probably got over PDT. Yeah. It was, uh, he came into Boston. We went out and got uh, lunch together. And at that time you were still kind of inconsistent. Like you were still, you were piecing yeah. it. It was cool to watch because every day you'd be like, I get something now. I get a little, another like little golden yeah. nugget. Like I started to understand, but yeah, you're right. Like at that time you were trying to trade every, every little strategy, right? Every yeah. bounce, you're trying to learn how to scale, do this, that, and the other thing. And I think your, your biggest killer at that time was just overthinking. You yeah. wanted to hit everything and like be perfect on everything and you were good at it but it was just it was such a killer but yeah. then what made the bigger change for you right was you just started focusing on one setup yeah from, yeah I'm, yeah i'm really glad you said that too because i'm actually looking back at that lunch we had and i remember i was like starting to feel some consistency but i wrote this huge word doc and i may have actually sent it to you and i called it unsustainable consistency where i was using the level two and the time and sales too much so hyper focused on it overthinking throwing so much size on risking like five, 10 cents. And I already knew better from years prior. Like, I don't know why I was doing it, but like I would have some big wins and then I would have some huge losses. And so it was funny when we met up for lunch, I remember being like, Oh, I'm starting to get it. I'm figuring it out. And now looking back to that, I'm like, I don't even know what I was doing back then. Yeah. It was only like <laughs> six months ago, but I think That's pretty common. What What's cool now is like, I, I think over the, like I've been meditating for the last like two years or so. And I think over that time, I've become really self-aware and conscious of my thoughts and what makes me feel certain ways. And I think throughout the, the last six months, I've been able to take that into trading. And I've started to really learn on like, what just makes me feel good? Like, where am I stressed? Where do I find myself overthinking? Where am I like, you can feel it in your body. I know James and Harry, you both talk about it in your videos. Like you can use your body as a tool to understand if you're oversized, undersized, if you're trading non-niche. And over time through, I think this kind of self-awareness and meditative process, I started to kind of shift my focus to just trading things that just made me feel good. Yeah. And I know we always say like, you want to, you want to make the most amount of money with the least amount of stress. And I never really took that to heart until I guess the last six months. And so I guess to make, yeah, a relatively long story shorter. Um, oh, cool. I started to just focus on these stocks that would fade. And I wasn't trading like the specific all day faders with a set criteria. I just noticed that whenever I'd screenshot prior runners, um, they'd always end up just fading. And it was different times throughout the day. And I kind of liked the idea of, you know, setting a few orders, you have your risk and stop in place, there's a place to add, and then you just kind of let it go. Because for me, I didn't even, I didn't want to look at the level two, I didn't want to look at the time and sales. Yeah. So, finding a strategy that would force me to not do that, I think was the most beneficial thing. And then over time, I started to ask, you know, the bear a lot of questions about, about his strategy. And I think it's been probably four or five months now where I've been just specific to all day faders. Um, and what's been so great about that is that it's so systematic that I actually don't think at all. Um, yeah. which what I think was the biggest thing for me um, because once a top is set, I know where my stop is. I can get on the size I want. I have a clear spot where I know I will add. And then I lower my risk to risk the same dollar amount. That to me was a light bulb going off that I can add it's as much it's size cool. as I want and risk the same amount. Like, I feel like with you, what's cool to watch is like, you might trade like, like I'll, I fucking trade like 10, 20 times a day, right? Like or Alex or Bao or Harry, like Harry doesn't trade that much actually. But like you, it's like, I'll see way less trades from you. Like maybe it's like, once a week or once every two weeks but i know in that one trade you're making more money than you were trying to trade like yeah. 10 different trades in a day yeah. and so so you got to this point just by listening to yourself right like kind of seeing like yeah. when you were trying to scalp like you used to say it, you were uncomfortable you always yeah. had these questions like i don't know where to add i don't know where to get in i don't know where <laughs> yeah. to scale and like it's cool to watch you grow to this trader now that like 
you have confidence in your setup and like i don't really see you taking losses that much i'm gonna knock on wood for you but like <laughs> yeah even your even the losses i've seen are so controlled and manageable yeah. and then the thank wins you. are like massive compared to that like you, you can see it right yeah thank so you. It's, it's it's cool man I, I love to see that and like i don't know it's like it's fun watching traders grow especially like that's why yeah. i love being a bot i love i love yeah. seeing it when you think- when you said that you were kind of like using the tape exclusively um maybe you can like kind of go in a little bit to what you were kind of like looking for or like what you even thought in your head because yeah. i know a lot of people i get a lot of messages from people who are like man like i know that you just trade off the tape and i'm like no bro i don't like you can't you can't just stare at the level two all day without a chart and then think that's going to work yeah you need to put all the little pieces together and that's why like i'm kind of happy that you did bring that up because there are a ton of people who are looking at, you know, let's say a place like high a day. And they're like, well, we see a lot of green prints going off on the tape, man. That means I should be yeah. wrong. And I'm yeah. like, bro, oh, that's just the wrong area. So like, maybe you could dive in a little bit as yeah. to like what you were searching for, what you thought was going to happen, because, you know, it does sound that like, you, like you did try to go a little bit like just off the tape. Yeah. And I mean, Coming in, like if you read Twitter and you only just read Twitter, that's a big thing that's talked about every single day. Whether it's like big names or like, you know, even kind of people who are smaller, that is a, a you know, something that's talked about almost 24 7 on Twitter. Like, oh man, do you catch that tape read? Man, that was dope. Yeah. Oh, the tape. So, like, maybe you could kind of go in, like, what you were kind of looking for. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, looking back, because again, it's probably like, over like over six months to a year from now, I think what I was looking back, I think I was just, I, I think I was afraid of trusting the lines. And so I would look to the tape in level two as confirmation that there was rejection. Yeah. And so I, I draw my line out. I wouldn't place my fantasy orders there. And I was like, I don't want to put my order there until I see it working. And then at that point, once you do think you see it working, it might get a little stuffy. Then I would be reactive. And I know there's some folks that are, reactive when adding and things like that Mm -hmm. but for my initial trade shorting like shorting like broken day one stocks into like those pre-market resistance lines i wouldn't trust my lines i wouldn't trust myself so i was using the level two of confirmation to be like oh i think now it's stuffing so this line is working you weren't necessarily looking for like oh hidden buyer oh hidden seller stuff like that you just want to see if it rejected or yeah i I think it was a little bit of both like it's funny because during this time it was the most inefficient way to trade like you should never trade like that but i did learn a lot about the level two and so i would see hidden buyers things like that which was great but i don't think those should ever be a reason to those shouldn't make a decision to enter or exit a position i think it can maybe just add a little confirmation to something that you already have in place if that makes sense yeah but- i think the tape's so funny like the, i think the tape confuses traders more than it should and i think they use it more than they should like like for me like i'm one of those guys like honestly i think i could trade without the tape and like trade the exact same way i trade now um just because i just trust my line like like yeah. bow and stuff like bow does use the tape and he talks about using the tape but like really all his stuff is fantasy orders so like in reality like I think it's a misconception and like you fell into it. I think I fell into it too, where like you rely and you're like, there's a, there's a signal in the tape that I'm missing the, yeah. the tape. And I know Harry's big on tape. So every, again, everyone's different, but the tape is just, to me, is just a tool that you can use to better your entries yeah. or to, you know, tell the story of the stock of that day. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's cool. And like, I feel like those little things probably kept you from growing for so long. Cause you were just like searching oh. for this Holy grail that didn't exist and you didn't find your holy grail until you found a setup that made you comfortable. Yeah. Yeah. And it wasn't until, yeah, until six months ago, I've been trading for five years and it took until the last six months to realize I need to stop focusing on things that would just stress me out. Yeah. Yeah. And for me, you know, I just wanted to jet in for one second. I think for me, like I spent a lot of time just purely watching just how stocks move, I think. And like, I would just like lock myself in a room where, you know, I would just watch like, these recordings just day after day after day after day until I finally got it. That's just what I kind of did. I think there's a lot mm-hmm. of ways to go about it. That's personally how I did. Like I would look how price kind of reacted around levels and stuff like that. But there is a ton of different ways to make money. And I mean, I think the route that I chose was definitely the hardest 
And like, I don't know if it's the most efficient, but I would just sit and watch because I was like, shit, like I need to get experience. I need to get screen time. How am I going to do that? I'm just going to sit and watch recordings day after day. Be 2.30 at friggin' in the afternoon. I'd be like, all right, here comes the open. Get my plan ready. You know, just <laughs> recording after recording. And that's what I would kind of do. Yeah. You know, and I would kind of picture myself as like, okay, if I'm a professional basketball player or a hockey player, how many times am I going to shoot the same ball or the same puck every yeah. single day until I'm good, until I can get it? You know, that's how I always kind of pictured it. And so that was just kind of my approach. But there are, you know, several different approaches that you can kind of yeah. take. And yeah. do you think that, like, if you had have just traded with fantasy orders, it would have been a lot more efficient than trying to sit yeah. and try and read the tape and stress yourself out? Uh, absolutely. Um, I think fantasy orders are just the way to do it because it, it should remove any sort of stress that you have, especially if you have like a pre-market high to risk. This yeah. is for shorting, at least. If you know where you're stopping out and you know your lines and you just put your fantasy orders and literally step away, it's the most stress-free trading that you can do. For me, it like still kind of didn't work with scaling and then adding like something just didn't click with me. But I think that's the best way to do it as a new trader or an experienced trader. Is like if you just set your lines and fantasy orders, it removes so much overthinking. And I'm glad you brought up how it works for you, Harry, with reading the tape, because everyone's different. Um, and just for me, it, it wasn't comfortable. And I realized I was getting stressed. Actually, it's kind of funny. I got this Garmin watch yeah. to, track my, to track my heart rate and like sleep and everything. And when I would look at the level two and tape, like James, when we would go out to lunch, like my average heart rate in a trade was like 100 to 110. And like when I go <laughs> surfing, it's at 110. And now when I trade, it's like 55. It's like I'm dead when I'm trading. And like, that's how it should be is like, you can almost use your body, use watches as a way to yeah. gauge like what works for you. Yeah. Um, so as you were finding your, like your setup, like, cause you are focused on these all day faders, like you said, what was it that you kind of dove into to get you to like your present edge? Like, what was it that you were looking yeah. at? Like, and what really got you to the point of com being comfortable in these trades? Yeah. Um, so I, I have to give a huge thanks to the, to the bear and MIC. I, I've asked him a million questions and he has a few videos that have really helped. Um, I did, there's a few things. I think the first thing is I did my own back testing and back testing doesn't necessarily have to mean that you're plugging away in Excel. It can simply mean taking screenshots of all of the faders that have worked over the last quarter year and just review them. So I would do that. And that helped give me a lot of confidence that looking at like 60 to 70 percent of these stocks that would just fade if a certain criteria was met just gave me confidence um that was i think the first big thing and then as of recent i might be going a little over the top here but i'm trying to create some code and create different things to remove any type of bias or emotion whatsoever so over the last three or four months i found out what like what criteria makes sense for all day faders and I use ThinkScript and Thinkorswim to create a code that's a custom scan for me so that all I have to do is focus on those stocks. I don't even look at anything else. And I use MIC as a scan. It's the best scanner yeah. that we could have. But I was like, if it doesn't fit this niche, I'm not trading it. And so yeah. what also has given me confidence over time is knowing that I'm trading a setup that I know is profitable if I just stick to my process. Mm -hmm. And that whole yeah. process is the biggest thing. And so if I can create within my process, do different things to prevent any type of thinking to enter that process, then to me, I'm going to be winning in the long term, if that makes sense. Yeah. And it's something that yeah. like when I place my orders, it's a conditional order. So once my limit order is hit, it'll give me my stop. It'll give me my profit cover. When I add, I'll just move them around a little bit. And I don't yeah, have to cool. do any thinking, which is great. Mm -hmm. And then there's that a few cool. other things I'm doing now to try to like automate a little bit more but that's what's given me confidence is knowing that a strategy is working and i have the discipline to stick to it yeah yeah I, what, oh, go ahead Eric. sorry i think like with the all day fader setup like i mean if you really simplify it down and you're you're you know you're talking about it um it really just means that you have more sellers than buyers for the entire yeah. day if we're really simplifying it down so how yeah. are you going to get that excess supply well, it's going to yeah. come from bag holders. It's going to come from dilution. And also, we're going to have excess supply throughout the day, whether we know it or not. We're going to have yeah. breakout traders that are stuck. We're going to have, um, you know, we're going to have those breakout traders who are stuck. We're going to have those shorts who are slamming the bids, right? All these things yeah. can lead into that excess supply, which makes the stock go lower. So, yeah. I mean, 
you can, there are a lot of people who are like, oh, this is like set up D12796. But all that really means at the end of the day is that we have more sellers than buyers yeah. for the entire day. And that every single person who bought was met with excess supply, excess sellers, which made yeah. the stock go lower, right? I'm glad you say that too, because I think the most important thing on top of just supply for getting these stocks to fade is having the range for it to come down. So if you yeah. can get excess supply, with enough range and meat yeah. where you can add yeah, and then continue to see it fade. It's the most important thing. Um, and to you simplify need some gravity, it, just, right? To, to be able exactly. to put it down, right? We needed to get power exactly. off the earth. Yeah, exactly. So I, I think one of the hardest things for like new traders is that they feel that they have to trade every day. Like every time they sit at their desk, if they're not placing 10, 20, 30 trades that they're failing, how did you get to the point now where you're comfortable going like a week two weeks, whatever, without trading, without touching a setup yeah. or anything. And what gave you that, like, that kind of like, I don't want to say Zen, but that confidence to just sit yeah. there, wait, and just be patient. So I think, you know, with a lot of meditation, you can do this thing where you can start to like recondition how your body and mind thinks and at a high level. And yep. if you recognize as an individual that you have certain thoughts that you're like, oh, I want to trade. I need to trade. I should get into this. And you recognize and are aware of those thoughts. You can, you can change the way you're thinking. And so what I did is every single day that I wouldn't see my edge present, I would just continuously remind myself that if I don't trade today, I'm preserving mental capital and real capital to attack when my edge presents itself tomorrow. And I think that friendly reminder that I would tell myself every single morning that if I don't trade today, I'm better positioned for tomorrow when my edge is there. I think it started to just be ingrained in me where I'm now okay sitting. I went three weeks, I think, in April. Not it's crazy. Did he get stuck? He looks like he's frozen. Tyler. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is just uncomfortable. Let's see. If he doesn't unfreeze, I'll tell a story. Oh, oh can you hear me? Oh, there, there you go. Know. There you go. Oh, shoot. I don't know You're where good. we cut out, but. No, um, so last thing, last thing we heard was um, you went three weeks in April without trading. Oh, yeah. And I guess, yeah, just to summarize, like, I think it was the reconditioning where I kept reminding myself it's okay to, to not trade because I'll be in full mental health to capitalize when my edge is there. That reminder daily um, has got me to a point where now I, I'm not worried or concerned about mm -hmm. not trading for a day. I think now, do you, do you, uh, my bad, Harry. You go. Sorry, no. Uh, you can just talk, and then I think I'll just do one more question to end it. Sure. So, do you do you think that all traders of all levels should try to incorporate some form of uh, meditation, uh, whatever they call it, you know, mental like focus? Like, do you think yeah. everyone should do that? And how do you kind of recommend? And you guys get started into that. I just want to yeah. ask James' question real quick because mine is similar. Because I did have a post about the same sort of thing about taking time off, about um, you know, really just. Um, I guess my post was more about just having some balance, being able to take some time off, like feeling good, like taking care yeah. of your mental health. So I think like that also adds into James as well, and that's a good place yeah. to end it. So I mean, I guess cool. as well as James's question, like thoughts on time off, thoughts on yeah. really just taking care of yourself. Yeah, definitely. These are great questions. Thanks for asking us to, to wrap it up. And let me know if I cut out, maybe share no, yeah, it Zoom will. or something. Oh, um, I think every single trader and non-trader should, should meditate. Um, it can be something as simple as one minute every morning, just focusing on the breath to something as 30 minutes to an hour. There's a whole conversation on visualization that I, we could get into in, an, in another podcast maybe. But I think yeah, every yeah. trader would benefit from it. Because in its simplest form, meditation, you're not removing any thinking. Like people think that when you meditate, you have to literally just be so still and nothing's happening. That's kind of the ideal state. But when you meditate, you're just becoming aware of all of your thoughts. And imagine as a trader, at any point throughout the trading day, you can just be aware of all of those little thoughts and voices in your head saying, you should add more size, or you should hold a little bit longer. You should remove your stop. Like all of those things that relate to fear and greed, if you can be aware of that before it happens, you can prevent yourself from actually acting on those emotions, if that makes sense. Yeah. So like, yeah, I think it's super important. And if everyone wanted to start, like I think Headspace and Calm, those apps are great places to start. That's what I did. 
And then anyone can shoot me a message in, in the MIC chat because I have a list of probably 10 to 15 books um, that I would recommend that relate to just kind of mental health and, and how to clear those thoughts. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so, so James, for your question, I think everyone would benefit, even if it's as simple as just a few minutes every morning before the market opens. Yeah. Um, and then uh, Harry, to your, to your question on like time off and, and as it relates to mental health and, and balancing that, um, I think it's super important. In February, I took two weeks off to go to Hawaii, and I didn't even I down, I deleted Slack from my phone too, deleted the charts, deleted everything. Yeah. Um, and it was one of the best things I could do. It was obviously hard because it's, you're like removing something you love from your life for two weeks. But when I came back, uh, despite the market being a little slow for all day faders, or it was actually a little trappy, um, I was just in such a good headspace. Like I wasn't overthinking. I was like, I'm just going to keep everything pretty slow. I sized yeah. down. So yeah. I think that that time off is so important just because yeah. I think some of us can get in this, this mode where we're constantly grinding, working, studying, and you just need those, those days away. And then I'll conclude by saying like my process pre-market um, used to be looking at three or four MIC videos a day. And now my process from 3.30 to when the market opens at 6.30, it's all doing things to just make sure I'm in the best mental state I can be prior to the open. And so it's talking with my parents and brother on the East Coast. It's sending them money for a cup of coffee. It's reading a few books. It's meditating for like 20, 30 minutes. And hopefully while I'm meditating, the stock doesn't pop up. So I don't, yeah. I don't miss the locate or something. But I, I just do things now to just make sure I'm in a good mental state. Because yeah, like when the market opens or when the stock hits my criteria pre-market, I want to be ready to capitalize. So all that to say, meditation is super important, I think. And making sure you're in a good mental state, I think, is, is what can make a trader successful. And I still have a lot to learn. That. Like I'm not saying I figured it out, yeah. but um, I think it's helped me start to realize where I want to be as a trader and where I'm going. Yeah, I like that. I love that. I think that's a good yeah, that's it for sure. Yeah, cool. Um, yeah, that's awesome. And I uh, think, uh, yeah, I think if any if anyone wants to reach out to Tyler, you know, reach out to him in chat. Um, yeah. And I, like I said, I've talked to him a million times and he is very helpful when it comes to that stuff and, and always a good person to help remind you to stay kind of uh, in that, good headspace and yeah thank you for coming on tyler cool. that yeah, was awesome great. thanks a lot yeah thank you both for having me no problem